It's my specialty. Okay, smile. Do you want a webinar blueprint that earns? Hey folks, if you're just getting into the YouTube channel right now, make sure you introduce yourself. We're going to be starting up here in a couple of minutes. You can introduce yourself on the chat window just to the right hand side. Please. Today we're going to be talking about pigs and permaculture and where they fit within the system. So We'll try and talk for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to get into Q&A. So if you have any specific questions about pigs and how they fit within the permaculture system, you can start writing them down on a piece of paper and then uh, post them a little bit later as we get a little bit further into the, the show today. We're going to be live for about two hours, and then we're going to, sorry, a correct, correction there, we're gonna be live for about an hour. Uh, we're gonna try and talk for about 20 to 30 minutes and then we're going to go to Q&A for you guys. Hey Kirk, how's it going? Nice to see you there. Nice to see you Frankie. Ken Flanders, welcome to the show. Little brother, Jeff from Calgary, awesome. All right, we're going to get started here in about a minute. So if you're just coming in, make sure you introduce yourself. I tried to get Dakota to play a little mandolin while we were waiting to get started here, but I couldn't quite convince him. You guys can try, though. <laughs> I'm still learning. It's not good yet. <laughs> I'm not sure how to pronounce that name. What? What? Shezhensi. Welcome. I'm assuming that you're from Russia or um, somewhere in the Eastern Bloc there. Um, love to know where you're calling in from. All right. So today I'm with Dakota Cohen from Grassroots Family Farm here in Alberta. He lives about two, two and a half hours north of me um, on a farm that is uh, they, they have a home quarter plus another a uh, couple of quarters that they manage as part of their operation. Um, Dakota and I also consult together so we, we consult right across uh, Canada. We design resilient homes acreages and farms and Dakota really kind of brings up the, the whole agroecology piece uh, when it comes to actually the design of large larger scale agricultural components that fit within the regenerative agriculture framework. Uh, Dakota is an incredible resource, and uh, I'd be lying if I told you that, um, how do I say this? Basically, we talk every day, and usually there's at least one time during that day uh, or during our conversation when we talk about pigs. So today, I wanted to have him on the show so that him and I could nerd out on pigs. You guys can nerd out with us, talk about uh, what you love about pigs, how they might fit into the picture, and we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the work that Dakota is working on uh, that I'm living vicariously through um, until I can get enough land and to get my own pigs. Um, so Dakota, why don't you um, tell us a little bit about a little bit more about yourself and what your interests are, and then we'll we'll kind of go through our schedule here that we've got um, planned out. Absolutely. So as Rob mentioned, I farm with my folks here. Uh, our farm's name is Grassroots Family Farm. Uh, my folks have been organic for over 30 years. Uh, they really were the, the pioneers of, of, uh, of that movement. And about eight years ago now, uh, I was working in construction and uh, hating my life. <laughs> and uh, just all I wanted to do was go back to the farm. But there was, there was uh, you know, growing up, there was no, there was no money in farming and, and I was encouraged to, to leave and go get a real, you know, job somewhere else. But, uh, it just, something kept calling me back. And, and so I decided to return to the farm and, uh, uh try to find a way to, to make it work. And the last, you know, eight years of my life have been spent trying to build a, um, a financially viable business model, 
um, for small farms and permaculture has been really foundational to all that. And um, so basically we, we run grass fed, finished beef, milk fed pork, and uh, we deliver, you know, some eggs to local cities around us. And as Rob mentioned, I do a lot of educational and, and consulting work as well. Awesome. So recently, uh, probably, I, was it last year, Dakota, that uh, I told you about the lesser beasts? Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I found this book and I'm going to just share it with you guys here because we're going to talk a little bit about kind of the key, find, key um, let's see here, the key insights that we had from this book, uh, The Lesser Beasts, which should be up on your screen right now. This book was written by Mark Essig, and it's probably one of the best books I've ever read on pigs. I think it's probably the first book I've ever read on pigs, actually. Um, but it's incredible. And if you're interested in how the pig has played an absolutely instrumental role in humanity, uh, really, uh, in food security, in uh, agriculture, uh, this is the book to read. It explains a lot of the really hard questions around why some cultures eat pork and some don't. Um, and it talks a lot about how pigs actually um, domesticated themselves. One of the most interesting parts about this book that I found uh, was, was the idea of um, all around what happened when slavery was abolished in the United States and how all of a sudden when slavery was no longer practiced anymore, um, basically uh, the, the I think it was called the land, what was the name? The land enclosure act. The land closure act. Yeah, basically they closed all the land off because essentially all the um, African-Americans that all of a sudden had their freedom now um, in, the, in the South were able to go and actually start supplying their own food essentially and the backbone of that food supply system was uh, was pork because these animals were basically able to uh, go off and forage on their own i mean they basically were solar collection systems that tasted really good and they would go off into these into the bush essentially collect calories that were not um, either palatable or accessible to humans and then bring them back to uh, the farmsteads that these people are managing and what the uh, founding fathers or the, the people that the politicians realized was that um, unless they, if they didn't close land down and privatize it, uh, they would not have a workforce essentially. So they wanted to basically make it difficult for people to uh, meet their own food needs so that they could grow the GDP of the economy. And, and I found that really interesting. And there's a couple of other things that Dakota and I were talking about yesterday around um, how the Spanish used them uh, as a military uh, mechanism. Do you want to talk a bit about that, Dakota? Yeah, totally. So when, um, when the Spaniards first came to South America, um, and uh, everybody's familiar with the um, kind of invasion of the, the Mayan Empire and, and how that all worked, well, uh, some of the evidence pointed to the fact that the, the Spaniards sent out uh, scouting vessels uh, you know, a decade um, prior to their their first invasion, and those were actual, actually peaceful missions where the Spaniards went and they basically scouted out all of South America. They went and met with the kings and and all the leaders of the the Mayan cultures and basically cased the joint to see how much gold they had. Uh, and then on their way back to to Spain, they threw off pigs <laughs> off the side of their ship. Um, on all the little islands around as well as in South America and North America so, because they knew that in 10 years or whatever when they came back with their you know army at their backs to take over the 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 new world they their food source would have propagated and would have been ready for them and so that's exactly what they did they came back later with you know thousands of men and um, they literally as they pushed their way across South and North America, uh, they pushed the, the pigs ahead of them, and um, which actually had did two things, and I don't know if this was in, intentional or not, but um, the, the, it allowed them to have a, a constant fresh source of, of high protein and high fat, but also as they pushed the pigs um, forward, 
the pigs were like the infantrymen of the, the Spanish military because the pigs would go ahead and root up all the gardens of the Mayans and destroy things and, and generally just run amok, just like pigs do. Um, so that by the time the, the Spaniards got there, the, the mines were without food and, and, um, and everything else, and they were really easy to conquer. Uh, and the, the same process was used in like, further in North America with, with um, uh, you know, more of the indigenous tribes up there, whereby the pigs were like set out to dig up their, their uh, kind of traditional foraging grounds for uh, things like roots and um, uh, shellfish and things like that in the ocean. And these pigs were literally used as a, as a weapon, uh, a biological weapon to, uh, to weaken the various enemies of, of the different world empires. Just, it's horrible and uh, incredible at the same time. Yeah, there's two things that kind of stand out for me on that. One is, uh, uh, you know, the Ossobao pig is actually a remnant of the, uh, the Spaniards uh, leaving pigs on islands to basically build up a food supply for their army. And um, it's a really interesting pig because it, it's really good at, it, it, it's basically what they call the ketosis pig because it, it's able to live really long periods of time without food. And so it actually goes into ketosis in the same way that, that humans do. Um, and so they're, they're an interesting pig from that regard. Um, the other thing that I, um, that I think about um, that you and I have talked about quite a bit in the past is this idea of if, you know, if it ever hits the fan and things kind of go awry, uh, this idea of just kind of letting your pigs out of the cage and or out of the pen and letting them go and and do what they need to do. I mean, what's the what's the gestation on a pig, Dakota? Uh, three months, three weeks, three days. Right. Days. So so they're really fast at breeding. I mean, th this is the ultimate food security element. Although I would say that the the caveat to that is the way that most people are raising uh, small scale hogs probably kind of defeats that concept. So tell, tell me a little bit more about some of the stuff that you're doing to try and build a more resilient pig. Totally. So kind of building off of that, um, like the, the, uh, the genetics that were, were brought to the, to the new world, um, you know, Via the the Spaniards, like the Osabao pig, and 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 eventually when Europeans and stuff came, they were they were old world genetics that were had been bred to live um, basically off, off of waste products. One of one of my favorite quotes from Bill Mawson is that a, a pig is basically just a garbage can with legs, and and that was their niche in the developed world is that they ate the things that nothing else would eat, including human waste and other, other uh, animal waste as well. Um, and so there were these incredible genetics in the, in the old world that were um, uh, very efficient on like low quality food. Um, they were high in fat, <clears throat> primarily for lard because, because fat was one of the um, uh, limiting factors in, in, the, in the diets of, of Europeans. Um, and also for food preservation and a lot of other stuff and candles and lubricants and everything else that lard is used for. And so anyways, and, and that, that those genetics evolved out of a, con out of a context of, of scarcity because it, Europe was a highly populated area. Um, resources were, were few and far between. And, uh, um, and so they, uh, the Europeans there had to, had to live a, um, uh, a more simple life. And then when they brought those genetics to North America, which was, you know, this kind of, um, uh, they, they went from a scarcity mindset to an abundance problem, which, you know, there's just food everywhere. Uh, they started to till up the, the plains and, and grow corn. And, uh, um, and in order to kind of uh, uh, maximize the, the production of these pigs, they started to breed them to, to be finishing more on, on grain. So as opposed to taking, you know, 18 or 24 months to finish one pig, um, they were doing it in six or seven months, feeding them a diet of, of you know, high corn. It was like 20, 20 bushels of corn was enough to fatten a, a pig to market weight. Uh, and they started to basically push the genetics um, uh, in a different way, trying to optimize for, uh, for yield and um, short-term productivity because, because of the space that they were in. <clears throat> Now, um, we've continued to do that for the last 150 years, 
And now we have pigs that can finish in five months um, and they're fed a diet of uh, like soybean meal, uh, soybean oil, uh, canola oil and canola meal is what predominantly pigs are fed in, in Alberta. In, in the US, they're still fed a lot of corn. Um, but uh, um, we've, we've just created these, these genetics that are, are dependent upon all of these other energy inputs. They're dependent upon a, uh, an industrial agricultural system. And uh, so as a result, you know, as a, as a small farmer who's trying to uh, partner with natural systems and things like that, we've had to uh, try to work our way back to the genetic uh, state that, that uh, was once available. And so, you know, on, on our place, and just as a caveat to that, like we, we raised uh, pigs in a barn um, for the first part of my life when I was a kid. Um, they were certified organic pigs, but they were pigs in a barn, no less, and, and fed certified organic peas and barley and stuff like that. Um, and so I, got, I came from that world of um, very energy intensive, very labor intensive, um, trying to you know maximize the the number of pigs you could you could grow on a property, going for volume as opposed to quality. <clears throat> and so now, um, given the, all the insights that come out of, of permaculture and trying to you know basically mimic biological systems, we're trying to go the other direction, which is to uh, minimize our energy input and uh, and go for quality as opposed to volume. So we started uh, five years ago with. Uh, um, uh, three, <clears throat> three purebred Berkshire sows. And uh, I've just been bringing in a boar every single year for the past four or five years. And every year I save my best pigs. And every year I make the test uh, a little harder, which is something that, that uh, Kit Farrow talks about when you're trying to uh, develop genetics, uh, is that uh, every year is a test. And if everybody gets 100% on the test, the test was too easy. So every year I increase the amount of forage that's in their diet. I decrease the amount of grain. Um, I, um, I decrease the, like all the different inputs that, that pigs normally get. Um, and, uh, and over the past four years, we've, we're now at a pig that is about probably 30 to 40% forage based <clears throat> uh, for their total diet. Uh, and we also feed a lot of skim milk and things like that. But it's just been amazing to, to get these pigs that, you know, they wouldn't even, if I was to try to feed what I'm feeding to my pigs now, four years ago, they wouldn't even recognize it as food. Uh, but now they, they uh, are totally accustomed to it. And, uh, you know, my pigs are starting to get longer digestive tracts to uh, better utilize the, uh, the, the low nutrient density of the, the grasses, as opposed to these pigs that are, are bred to, to run off of, uh, um, you know, basically pure protein. They have very short digestive tracts. And uh, it's just a trial and error thing that we've been going through and it's been working phenomenally well. So this year I raised uh, uh, pigs that were 200 pounds hanging weight. That's with the head and hide off. We skin our pigs, we don't scald them. So 200 pounds hanging weight was the average weight. Some were pushing 220 um, in uh, seven months or less on a diet of, of like fermented feed, milk, cattails, forage, a bunch of other things. Um, and they were all, all limit fed. They never had free access to, to food. <clears throat> that being said, there's another guy in the States, a uh, fellow by the name of Jeffrey Walters. Uh, if Rob can pull up that website there. He runs a, an operation called Sugar Mountain Farm and a uh, phenomenal resource. If you're interested in, in um, learning how to raise low energy input pigs, uh, the way that they, they're, they're meant to, to be run, this guy is, is in my mind, one of the leaders in North America and he has pigs that are, that are around the 95% forage base for, for their, um, for their food source. And, uh, and he's still finishing pigs in like eight to nine months, I believe, which is incredible, but it's taken him probably 10, 15 years to get to that point. It, it, it is possible. You just need to be very deliberate and, uh, um, and uh, start off with, genetics that are as, as close to uh, what you're looking for as possible, but also that there's you know, a reasonably good genetic pool so that you can select from and go from there. So Dakota, I don't think the uh, talk today would be complete without some cute piglet pictures. <laughs> pull them up. For sure. 
um, Rob, can you, um, for whatever reason, when you share your screen, it locks me out of mine. Oh, and yeah. I, can, there you go. I can't do anything. Um, you're still, still doing it though. I, all I can see is your face. I'm not sure what's happening, but I'm totally locked out. <clears throat> there, I'll make you the host. Haha. <laughs> Lock you out now. <laughs> okay. What the heck is going? It's still, uh, I don't have control of my screen. Like it's just, you've commandeered my, uh, my computer. Well, and you're going to have to give me back host permission now. Cause I don't even have that. <laughs> oh God. Oh no. Here we go. I've got it again. Okay. Well, if we can't get any, uh, images of pigs, let's just keep going through our list here. Um, so just, um, one of the interesting things that I think, uh, you know, we could talk a little bit more about is how you, you know, integrate these pigs into the whole kind of operation and ecosystem of your farm. And so they don't just sit idly in, you know, um, a pen and do nothing. You got, you actually put them to productive use in, in various places. And I know that as your farm is evolving, you, you're, you guys are adding more systems and fences to try and, um, you know, increase that. Uh, that function of the animal itself. But I really love how, I mean, you have a whole presentation, actually it's on YouTube, you guys can check it out. I'll put it up in the, uh, the show notes here um, on uh, integrating ch uh, pigs, chickens, cows, and, and kind of bringing it all together into one ecosystem. You wanna talk a little bit about that, Dakota? And I'll bring up the other uh, presentation there. Yeah, for sure. So as Rob mentioned, you know, we've, we've been trying to, to integrate the various systems on our, our farm together for a lot of different reasons, um, namely for uh, uh, labor efficiency on our end, um, as well as all the beneficial interactions that take place um, uh, by integrating things together. So for example, uh, in the video that Rob's going to pull up, I, I kind of talk about our, the hub of our, <clears throat> of our um, uh, farm is, is a kind of a multi-purpose pen area with a uh, you know all the amenities around that. Uh, there's a, an automatic heated water there. All of our feed storage is there. It's close to our house, uh, and in that area, we basically change different gates and um, bring in different um, you know fencing materials at different times of the year to 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 control the the, the energy flows of of the various animals through our systems. But essentially, we have we have our our pigs, our chickens, our milk cows, and our beef cows, all in in um, uh, taking up the same space niche on our farm. But the timing is different um, for all those animals, so they're not always all there at the same time. Uh, to, but to give you an example of some of the kind of functions that we're using our pigs for, um, namely, it's for compost production and the cleaning of our cattle beds. Uh, in, in our climate, for six months of the year, uh, we we're basically just trying to keep things alive. This morning when I woke up, it was minus 35. <laughs> and, uh, you know, animals, uh, just they, they, um, they have special requirements in, in, in those kinds of conditions. One of them is, is wind production and, uh, and I believe access to, to water. You can get cows to, to eat snow. Um, and that's a, that's a whole other conversation there as well. But uh, essentially, we're using uh, yeah, our pigs to, to root around in the, in the bedding pack of the straw, mix in the, the cattle manure so that uh, it's all locked up and, and the beds are kept clean. Um, and while the pigs are doing that, they're actually eating the cattle manure. They're uh, foraging for mist grain and other food sources uh, in the straw pile. Um, so one of the reasons um, we bring all of our animals together in the wintertime is that for six months of the year, there's no foraging opportunities. For most animals for pigs and, and chickens because the ground's frozen four feet solid and there's a foot of snow on the ground and so by bringing the cattle in who have the ability to go and forage out in our in our swaths grazing and different things like that they're able to bring those resources back um, to a central location deposit them for our pigs and chickens who then can uh, make use of some of those resources while providing functions we also use our pigs for um, tilling and weeding in our gardens. They're, they're, uh, there's only two things that'll kill crabgrass. One of them is Roundup and the other one is pigs. And we don't use Roundup, so pigs are, uh, pigs are the obvious choice for that. They absolutely love it. Um, and of course, there's all these other integrations that if you just go watch that, that hour-long presentation and, uh, and you can see it all there, all the pictures and stuff. 
or come for a farm tour. And uh, the next one's June 23rd. You can see it in the flesh. Yeah, I'll put a I'll post a, a link. Do you have the farm tours up on your website, Dakota? They're, they're they're not. We haven't made them live yet, but in the next uh, next couple of weeks, we're gonna we're gonna launch that. So okay, uh, I'll I'll put your website up in the show notes here. So one more thing I want to talk a little bit about because I think it's it's really important is the the kind of vegetarian vegan paradigm um, and kind of eating meat and being an omnivore and. Um, First off, I just want to say that I don't think being a vegetarian or vegan is necessarily bad or or anything. I think that it, it all comes back down to personal choices and context. I do think, though, that your diet should be dictated by your locale. And so if, if being a vegan or vegetarian is something that's very important to you, then you should consider living kind of closer to the subtropics or in, in the tropics themselves. That's actually a sustainable diet down there. But as we get up into the climates up here where it does get down to minus 35, at least right now, we can't grow coconuts. Um, our coconuts actually walk around on four legs and they grunt a little bit. Um, and so I read a book once called Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It, an incredible book on uh, human diet and some of the most reason, uh, recent research around um, human metabolism and um, what a sustainable food source is for us. And what was really interesting is that when you actually break down the fat in the pig, it's actually a combination, like it's like 50% olive oil, 50% uh, coconut oil. Um, and so we love the idea of bringing in <laughs> these exotic fats from all over the world, which actually creates all sorts of ecological issues from those regions. It's no different than, than expecting the West Coast of Canada to supply uh, wild salmon for the world. It just can't happen. Like the fisheries will collapse. And so in the same way, that if everybody in the world decides that coconut oil is what they should be consuming, there were, you know, those those tropical areas are going to have to cut down all of their forests in order to try and meet the demand of coconut oil. The sustainable fat in a northern region is a combination of dairy fat, pork fat, tallow, so lard, tallow, um, chicken fat, basically um, fats that grow inside of animals because um, here, our limiting factor is really decomposition, um, whereas in the tropics, it's not. And so in order for these ecosystems to evolve, they needed to partner with animals like pigs, cows, chickens, um, or, or fowl, I should say, um, in order to accomplish that decomposition goal. And so one of the interesting things about pigs, which is um, one of the things that I find so interesting about kind of how you're grading your animals now, is that uh, fat is actually a resource that we've been trying to breed out of these animals. And I believe that going forward, um, fat is going to be probably one of the most important metrics in, in terms of what the pig actually produces, because there's just so many, in, in addition to food, there's so many products with it. And then from a, from a health perspective, I mean, you cannot search anywhere on YouTube right now uh, and not find something on vitamin D deficiency. I mean, North Americans, even Northern Europeans are, are uh, hugely deficient in vitamin D. And one of the reasons that that is, is that a lot of the, even the organic animals are being grown inside without sun, essentially. And, and so you're, you're looking at to actually getting vitamin D testing done on your, on your animals. I mean, yeah. um, if you've ever wondered, how is it that North American, Western North Americans are vitamin D deficiency, but the Inuit lived in the far north for thousands and thousands of years without these kind of issues. Um, the reason is, is that they, they ate animals that were grown in broad daylight or in, in the sun. Totally, absolutely. And just to kind of um, another uh, kind of corollary uh, story to that that I think is, is worth looking into is uh, the Weston A. Price Foundation and particularly Sally Fallon has done a lot of research um, that, that, that is, it was referenced, uh, their website is the Weston A. Price Foundation dot, dot org. And, um, uh, she has this incredible YouTube presentation and we can throw a link to that in the, the show notes afterwards. Um, it's called the, um, the oiling of America. So not the soiling, but the oiling of America. And basically she talks about how, uh, after the, after the first world war, um, the, uh, different in, during the industrial Revolu revolution uh, scientists figured out how to uh hydrolyze vegetable oil uh, which is a an unsaturated fat so at, at room temperature at room temperature it's liquid 
Um, anyways, they, they figured out how to saturate unsaturated fats through a chemical process. And, um, um, and so there was this, uh, suddenly all these cottonseed oil, um, you know, canola oil, vegetable oil, things like that were, which were these industrial, industrialized crops that could be grown on massive scales with very few people, um, were able to be turned into, uh, you know, soaps, lotions, cooking oils, all these different things. And, uh, and in order for the, but at, at the time, everybody was using lard and, and all these other um, kind of traditional cooking fats <clears throat> for all their soap and things like that. There's actually advertisements from the First World War from North America um, where the government was getting people to save their uh, uh, grease strippings like from frying bacon and take it to these centralized drop-off locations because they used lard to make munitions for the war effort. <laughs> um, anyways, so there was this, there's actually a, a legitimate conspiracy where uh, uh, various industries um, coerced the government into um, and other like the Heart and Stroke Foundation and things like that to basically put out false information about the dangers of saturated fats or animal fats so that they could create a market for this new product that they had created, which has like, just look up like free radicals and all this other stuff. Uh, it's, it's worthwhile looking into. It's an incredible story. And, and this, um, uh, Mary Enig is, a, is another doctor who has um, done a lot of research into this. It's just starting to come out in the last probably 10 years now uh, in a big way. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a dark point in our history, but we've, you know, we, uh, we can come out of that now and we can start to breed pigs that, um, and other animals that are actually producing uh, uh, human nutrition as opposed to, you know, crops that are producing, you know, basically agricultural chemicals. <laughs> Yeah, I just found out last night, actually, I was at a friend's uh, farm, actually, and he, um, they were telling me, sorry about that, there's a phone going off in the background there, um, they were talking about how um, there was a shipment of, that's really frustrating, Dakota, I'll let you take the stage there while I go turn that off. Yeah, no problem. Um, so, just a few other notes here. <clears throat> Um, of uh, kind of some of the, the benefits of, of pigs or pork as a, as a food source is that pork has one of the highest protein contents of, of, of any food source. And, um, uh, and if you get a lard pig, a lard based pigs like the Berkshires, um, they, uh, one pig can produce, uh, you know, if, if you have a 200 pound pig, there's going to be probably, you know, 60 pounds of, of high quality protein, uh, another uh, 60 pounds of fat, and then which is like lard fat, uh, or sorry, kidney fat and back fat, which are bad fat, back fat is typically used for like frying and uh, things like that, or soap. And the, the kidney lard was typically used for baking because it doesn't have any flavor. And, and the remain, remain of the pig is, is bones. And so literally an organ. So one pig can supply you with all your protein needs, all your fat and cooking needs, and even for soap, and all your, your bones to make bone broth for a family of four for an entire year. It's just phenomenal. And, and you could raise that pig off of the waste scraps from your chickens um, and, and, uh, and your gardens and, and other animals um, with almost no supplemental uh, um, protein source. <clears throat> if you have the uh, proper genetics and you manage them correctly uh, it's just phenomenal and, and that pig will be ready for harvest in a single year and if you but if you don't harvest it it'll produce eight more babies <laughs> which go and, and multiply on and on and on so yeah totally talk about a procreative asset absolutely um, so we're going to get to Q&A now. There's a bunch of questions there. Feel free, guys, to uh, start posting your questions, and I'll go through the chat window, and we can get Dakota to, uh, to answer them um, one at a time here. If you found this information valuable, I'd love it. Uh, just from a feedback perspective, if you can hit the like button down below, feel free to share this on social media. That's great. Um, before we get into q and I'm just going to um, talk a little bit about how a sec here. Hey Rob, can you can you try to kick me out of the the webinar and then I'll sign back in again, if possible, just so I can get my screen back? Because sure, yeah, totally, we can do that. 
Okay, so while Dakota's doing that, we're just going to remove him and then bring him back in. Uh, I'm not sure actually if I'll be able to bring you back in, Dakota. Oh, well, then it's not a big deal. I just, it'd be nice to, if I could bring up some, some photos and stuff. But, okay. okay. Um, we'll just stick with the uh, the Q and A then, and we'll try this again next time when we uh, go live again. Okay, so if you're just getting in, or you you've been listening in, um, if you want more information, you can get specific resources uh, from our website at vergepermaculture.ca. You're welcome to join our mailing list. Uh, both Dakota and I contribute to that from time to time. There's free e courses on our website, which I'll put into the show notes. Um, we also have passive solar greenhouse case studies that you can check out. Um, we offer a permaculture design course a couple of times per year. And we also have an online training permaculture pro webinar series. So if you're looking for more tailored, um, a more tailored ability to ask uh, questions on a one-to-one -one basis, um, that might be a good fit as well as consulting both Dakota and I do consulting on this type of stuff. So, all right, without further ado, let's get into the Q and A session here. So I know one of the questions uh, that was asked a, a little bit uh, uh, earlier there, Kirk was asking why not just go with um, large blacks as they're, uh, as he calls them, a pure grazing pig. Um, so the, I guess uh, Kirk's asking a question about uh, one specific breed over, over another. So we have Berkshires on our farm. Um, there's a variety of reasons that I went with Berkshires as opposed to large blocks because I, I did do a lot of research on on uh, the different heritage breeds to see which ones hadn't been basically downgraded through genetic um, like genetic selection um, because I because I knew it was going to be a process to build back to a pig that that had more of the genetic characteristics that I wanted and large blocks were a really good really good fit. Um, the problem that I found is that there weren't a lot of breeders in my area. Um, so there wasn't a lot of genetic diversity around me uh, here in central Alberta. Uh, maybe it's different up, up in, uh, um, in the peace country up there, Kirk. But uh, part of my uh, context is uh, um, I don't, uh, because I do a lot of consulting and, and educational work, uh, I'm limited to the amount of facilities that I can, I can maintain um, properly uh, up to the standards that I want and having, um, um, doing my own breeding and like raising my own boars is, would require a bunch of, has a bunch of needs that don't fit my context. And so in order for me to, to basically focus on what it is I wanted to do, which was to raise the most nutrient dense pork uh, I could possibly do for our, our customers while uh, breeding an adaptive kind of genetics that, that could be then shared with our community. Um, I, I knew that I needed to have a local community around me that was also interested in the same thing and had, uh, was able to do some of those other requirements. So there's a lot, there's some incredible breeders in my area that I can easily get uh, really good Berkshire genetics from. Um, that was the one reason. The other reason is that large blacks tend to have um, large ears that, that covered their eyes. And I had heard um, some here say that that um, uh, made them difficult to electric fence. Uh, I don't have any direct personal experience with that. It's probably not a, a big deal. I'm sure they would just learn to, um, you know, be a little more gingerly around, uh, around electric fences. Um, but taking that a step further, I actually don't agree with that, that statement that, you know, like large blacks are, are, are uh, an only grazing pig or uh, Cooney Coonies, uh, K-U-N-E, K-U-N-E uh, is another breed that is being largely advertised as like a, a strictly grazing pig. And, um, uh, uh, animals adapt, genetics are adaptive, and the, the, the breed or the shape of an animal or whatever it looks like its color is a result of the context that it was raised in. And so if you, uh, any pig in the world can be turned into a grazing pig. A classic case in point is Jeffrey Walters. He's breeding like commercial hogs. He actually deliberately brought in commercial hog genetics, which have been bred to uh, grow rapidly and produce lean meat. Um, for whatever reason, he's focused on lean meat for his customers. And he's taking these commercial pigs and he's finishing them on 95% grass. Um, and so you can do anything with genetics. It's, you just have to create the, the context that, that you're looking for and then select for that. Um, so don't, 
uh, I would encourage people not to get hung up on one breed versus another. Uh, think about, do, do research on the different breeds, uh, figure out, you know, look at the size of the animals, uh, the, the context that they were raised in, whether there's local breeders available. If you want to be the guy that brings in mangalitsa pigs from, uh, you know, Croatia and has to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to, to do that and have them quarantined at the airport for months and go all through that process, if that is what satisfies your holistic goal, that's great. And you will be a tremendous asset to your community. But if you just want to raise a wiener pig or two for the summer, um, then uh, you want to find somebody who's breeding pigs that are going to be able to finish efficiently. They're, they've already been programmed to grow efficiently on, on grass. And that does, that's not breed specific, that's context specific. Yeah, one of the interesting things about all of that, and I want to bring it back to humans for a second, is this um, concept of uh, the, uh, the the Dutch uh, baby boomers that all got um, yeah that all got diabetes after World uh, well it, they, it's been recently that they've gotten the diabetes. So after World War II, Holland went through a six month famine, and during that six month famine, the babies that were I believe it's in the second trimester or third trimester. Um, of birth, um, they were receiving information from their mothers uh, through their, their metabolism, basically indicating that Holland was not getting any calories. And so the babies were preparing themselves uh, in order to move into a world that had a very low caloric um, uh, availability essentially. And so that changed the way that their bodies adapted to the ecosystem they thought that they were going to uh, enter into. And so one of the things that Dakota and I've been talking a lot about is how, what, what does that expression look like in, in pigs? And I suspect it's pretty similar. And so if you're feeding, um, sows, a high forage based diet of, of hay and, and forbs and, um, uh, basically not grain or less grain, uh, those baby piglets are gonna be receiving information through the placenta in the same way that humans are. And so, and I think that the, the, the big crux here, and I think this is something you, you told me, Dakota, was this concept that all pigs basically evolved from one, um, like a wild boar, basically. I mean, the expression of heritage breeds are essentially, as you, you put it, um, an expression of, of various contexts globally and the way that these animals, basically the animals adapted to provide them with the highest chance of survival. And so that's why we have all these different breeds out there. The exciting part with all of this, because we get really hung up on this idea of heritage breeds, is that you can get really, really crazy about a specific breed or you can just build a new one. Like there's no limit to the number of breeds that we can actually create. And, and a lot of this hard work was done 100, 200, 300, even 1,000 years ago. Um, we've kind of lost that desire almost or that, that knowledge. It can happen with plants. It can happen with pigs. It can happen with chickens. Um, I think that, that one of the most powerful um, businesses and or legacies that you can leave on this world is to develop a new Gen genetic uh, makeup of any kind of plant or animal that we depend on as, as humans. Um, and I think that that's not just some random permaculture engineer guy saying this. I mean, Monsanto, Cargill, all the big guys know this. That's why they're all in the genetics game and they want to lock up uh, life essentially. Um, but the thing is, is that small farmers and small homesteaders can move way faster than these large agrochemical companies um, can and we can do a far better job of it too because instead of just moving one or two genes in a slightly different direction when you are feeding 12 piglets inside the womb of a sow a very specific context specific diet you're going to have more capacity to make adaptive genetic choices and selections and adaptations than uh, you'll ever be able to do in a lab essentially so the next question um, is um, Will Dakota be offering piglets to other farmers? Uh, that's something that, that uh, we're starting to get into. Uh, this will be actually the first year that um, I'm going to be selling uh, bread gilts as well as wiener piglets. Um, uh, because I've been, it's, it's taken me, um, you know, th this is really the first year where um, I, I felt like everything started to click together. There was, there must have been a leg 
leg time or uh, with with uh, with the genetic suction and and the um, the context design that I was doing and, and what Rob was talking about, like where you basically um, programming piglets in, inside of the of the womb, is exactly what I've been doing. So every year when I when I get my sows bred, uh, that's when I start making the test harder. So every, every year um, my my sows have been getting more and more forage in their diet, um, so that through the whole gestation period of of um, while their babies are growing inside them, those babies are being programmed to, to learn how to um, digest a different kind of food source. And it's, it's incredible. This year, I was looking at pictures of like my previous pigs versus this pigs, and the shapes of their heads is different. The shapes of their bodies is starting to shape. They're starting to be deeper in the, in the belly as opposed to these long, skinny, lean pigs. And uh, it's just amazing that you can, you can see that. So yeah, we are gonna start offering um, uh, uh, bread gilts and breeding stock and um, and also feeder piglets so that other people could just buy um, like two two male piglets that have been castrated so that they can raise their own protein on, on their acreage or, or homestead um, for the summer and not have to worry about you know all the genetics and all the other stuff that that goes into all that because it's it's a lot of infrastructure and time to do that so if you're interested in that just uh, send me an email and, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, talk to you about that Cool. The next uh, question was, Dakota, in your integration with farm animals video, um, you integrated your pigs, your cows and chickens. I'd like to know if that system is still working for you. Uh, totally. So the, uh, there, there has been challenges with it. Um, I'm not going to lie. Every day for about three years, I had to change something. Uh, there, one of the, the fallacies of, of kind of permaculture is that you just sit down one day in front of a sheet of blank sheet of paper and you design out a system and then you just go build it and it's perfect. <laughs> uh, that never happens. Uh, design is an iterative uh, ongoing process that really never stops. And so uh, in the early years, there was a lot of, of uh, uh, changes that I had to make. Um, but now I'm at a point where the system is so adaptive that if I'm, if I'm ever having trouble, like for example, uh, um, one of the challenges is for when your uh, when your cows are, are calving, uh, because pigs are omnivores and they will eat things that uh, that they associate with food, and um, and so you know I obviously don't want to have my my cows calving when there's you know a 400 pound sow lurking around the corner, and so I just have a system that allows me to to separate them from that. Uh, it's also really important to not ever this is really important, never ever feed a pig around other animals um, uh, that, that the pigs will feel threatened by. I've had pigs attack cows because they felt threatened um, and they were trying to protect their food, kind of like a dog. Um, and, um, and, but that's an easy fix. You just, you section cordon off a, a corner of the pen with a hot wire or an electric fence wire that's uh, short enough for, to keep cows out, but tall enough to allow pigs in and hasn't been an issue. So uh, I'm not gonna lie, there, there's a huge learning to curve to this. If you are interested in integrating some of these animals together, uh, come talk to me, come for a tour, come see how it's done. I can save you hours of mistakes. I, I offered a course uh, two years ago now, and um, uh, a lady uh, went home and, and told one of her friends who had chickens and pigs that, oh my God, you need to, you need to integrate your chickens and pigs together because of all these reasons, you know, they'll, they eat each other's wastes and they clean up the food scraps and all this other stuff. And so our friend promptly did that. And I got a, uh, an email a week later um, asking, hey, have you ever had your pigs eat all your chickens before? <laughs> and I started asking questions and it turns out that the chickens and the pigs were actually locked in a pen together. So there was no way for the chickens to escape. Um, the pigs were fed a diet that was very low in protein and, and low in nutrients. And so the pigs were actually like nutrient deficient and the piglets uh, weren't raised from birth around chickens. And so they basically like, they, they came to the farm as, as hundred pound wiener pigs or 60 pound wiener pigs. And they'd never seen a chicken before. And uh, essentially the pigs just chased the chickens around the pen until the chickens exhausted themselves and died. And then they nibbled a little bit and figured out that it was food and, and went to it. Um, but that being said, I feed my pigs when a chicken dies, I feed the dead chicken to my pigs. Uh, when we're butchering chickens, I feed the chicken scraps to my pigs. I've never once had a pig kill a chicken. Um, uh, 
uh, they just don't associate it with food. And I've, I have a system that allows for chickens to get out and pigs to get in. So it, it works very well. But it's, awesome. it's not without uh, <laughs> tweaking. <clears throat> Fantastic. Uh, Kirk says, um, so we got time for kind of one more comment and then uh, I think we'll wrap up. So Kirk says, what about the idea that uh, your breeding your breeding does better when they grow up. I know cattle from southern Alberta do not do as well up here in the peace country. So I'm not uh, I'm not sure exactly. I think Kirk is saying maybe that breeding does better when the pigs are older. What are your thoughts on that, Dakota? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think I, I took that as like as um, like like if, if 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 I'm breeding genetics like genetics like cows from the south they they were bred and lived in a context that was specific to southern Alberta, and it doesn't make sense to bring them up north. I think I think that's what he's saying, and and if that is, I I completely agree. Um, but that being said, if um, uh, if for whatever reason there aren't um, uh, good genetics already locally adapted in your context. Um, and somebody has some down south and they're, they, they fit what you need, bringing them in a small closed herd and then starting to adapt them for, to your context might make sense. But you can save yourselves uh, years and years of struggle if you find somebody who, who in your area that has your um, same like climatic context, your same goals, because um, you can have galloway bulls that are um and that are one's finished on uh, has bred to been finishing on grass and another one that's been bred to finish on grain and they're going to give you a different result so it's like the breed isn't specific um it's the context that's important and so i have no problem bringing in genetics from outside of an area if it fits your if it's a better fit for your context but if possible try to find already adapted genetics in your areas particularly with cows because like a pig will can can be bred in six months and they can they can give birth in less than a year to eight sometimes twelve piglets um, and then those twelve piglets can can go on and give birth and so you can very quickly like like we in four years have um, reverted back I'd say pretty pretty close to where we want to be um, just in a few years whereas cows will take um, a, a cow can't be bred or can't give birth until she's two. Um, so there's a, there's an extra year leg time in there. They only give, to, um, birth to one cow at a time typically. And there's a 50, 50 chance that that's going to be a male or female. And so the, the scale of the timeline to make those, uh, changes in, in your breeding herd for cattle is much longer. For example, my parents have been breeding, um, a closed herd for 30 years uh, on, on our property, only bringing in bulls for 30 years and, and now we have an incredible, um, you know, breed of cattle that's kind of our own um, that allows us to to grass finish beef in 18 months uh, to a, a level that most guys aren't doing in 26 months. Uh, but it took us 30 years to get there, right? So it's <clears throat> totally, yeah, that's amazing. So Dakota, I'm just going to show folks your website here, okay. uh, and so if people want to check out. You're going to be posting a, uh, a tour up here shortly. So if you are in Alberta or can get to Alberta, I highly recommend these tours that Dakota puts on. They're super informational. They take about a half day, so they're worth your time. Um, and Dakota is basically taking permaculture to a whole new level uh, in Alberta from um, a scale perspective, but also um, showing how to... Uh, manipulate or utilize some of these concepts that Bill talks about in his books uh, in the northern cold climate. So definitely worth your time to go and check out what he's doing. Um, if, you just want to scroll, if you just want to scroll down there, there's a, um, so folks can see there's a, there's just a link. If you are interested in the tour, um, the best way to do it is just to sign up to our newsletter. Um, I only send out a newsletter um, kind of like once a, once every, Every, every couple months, I don't do a lot, um, but the, the main one is is for when we launch our, our newsletter. So if you just subscribe to that, you'll get an email for when you can um, you can register for it. And um, you can just, you register through our website. It's really simple. Um, so that's the best way or uh, like us on social media and we'll post it up there. But um, our newsletter gets, gets first choice to come. We can only um, have a hundred people at a time. It always sells out. So if you're interested, uh, 
make sure that uh, that you sign up quick. <clears throat> there is one more serious question, Dakota, that we should address, which What's is that? what is your favorite Pokemon? <laughs> Pikachu, definitely. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, any any other places that you can recommend uh, for resources before we close out today? Absolutely. Um, uh, one of my uh, one of the resources that I really enjoy for all animals is um, Stories Guide to Pigs, Chickens, Rabbits, Lambs, whatever it is. Um, uh, no, it's it's uh, with a Y, Rob. <clears throat> um, yeah, Stories Guide to Pigs, Chickens, whatever. Uh, they're fantastic books. They're very well written. They're easy to read. Uh, they really give you a good understanding of, of what the needs and yields are for any animal. Um, they, they have nothing to do with permaculture. There's, there's no talk about design or integration or anything in these books, but they are uh, a really good collection of the, the basics of what you need to know about any breed or, or species of animal um, so that you can then uh, build off of that and start adapting things to your own context. They also have a really good book, um, a different books on breeds. So I think there's one on pigs. I know there's for sure there's one on like poultry and it's just a, uh, it's just like a, a giant book of all the different breeds. Um, and it talks about kind of their, it, it's, it's funny you mentioned the, the Pokemon thing. One of my, uh, um, one of our customers who, who works with, um, uh, uh, educating children. There it is. Sheep, goats, cattle, and pigs. That's a great resource as well. Um, she had this idea of, of creating these little like trading cards for animals, um, similar to like a, like a Pokemon card or whatever, where it's like, like the name of the animal or the breed and then like what its attributes are and, and uh, its rare features. And then using that to teach kids about um, agriculture and, and, and permaculture. But you could have all these different like, oh, you've got the bard rock, Plymouth Rooster versus the uh, Berkshire Pig or whatever. <clears throat> so, awesome, great. Okay, thanks, guys. So, hopefully, you found that useful. If uh, if it was uh, valuable to you, please hit the like button. We'll be posting this uh, a little bit later today on YouTube, so you can watch it again. Um, and if you're interested in more of these live uh, shows, we're going to be on YouTube again at six o'clock Mountain Standard Time for our Introduction to Permaculture Part 3 this Wednesday night. Uh, so that's Wednesday night, 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, Introduction to Permaculture Part 3. We're also going to be doing another live show on Friday at 3.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time on making better decisions. So the whole holistic context conversation. So if you're interested in that, make sure you show up for that as well. Any last words, Dakota? Yeah, I just I just remembered a, a joke that I heard Bill Mollison tell about pigs, and I think I'll, I'll close with that. So um, there's this, uh, this townie or uh, uh, a businessman, he's driving along a highway and uh, um, he sees this farmer out in the field underneath an oak tree um, holding up this 150 pound pig, it looks like. And so, that, so he's, he's like pushing the pig up into the tree so that the pig can, can, the pig can eat a few acorns off the, the tree. And then, and then he sets the pig down and kind of rests for a while and then picks the pig up again so that the pig can eat a few more acorns. and. And the, the guy, the business guy driving on the highway just is like, what the heck is going on here? This is just, this is just crazy. So he slams on his brake and, um, and hops out of his car and he runs over to the farmer and he says, he says, what are you doing? And the farmer says, what does it look like? I'm feeding my pig. And he's, the farmer goes and again, picks up the pig up into the tree. And, and um, the business guy says, but, but don't you see, like, you're, you're wasting time. Like you could just, you could just let the pig eat the acorns off the ground. And the farmer turns around to the, to the business guy and, kind of gives him a pitying look and he says, see, you don't understand anything about pigs. Pigs don't care about time. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I love it. I love that joke because it, it perfectly captures like the, the nature of a pig, but also the nature of people who raise pigs. They are like, they're just sheer joy to be around. Like, like I, I would go and, and, and carry a pig around and feed it acorns for no other reason than it would make the pig happy. <laughs> Anyways. Thanks, everyone. Hopefully you found this valuable. We'll see you guys again on Wednesday night. Talk to you guys soon.